got emissions of about anywhere between 3 and 7 percent of the volume of gas being extracted, it makes that gas more carbon intensive than coal. And these are companies that are, I can honestly only describe them as brutish. Out of the van, whoever is, uh, yeah, get out of the van. Carried on. I right. have not been warned at all. When would I have jumped away! We're looking at 30 years of fracking, and that will take us way beyond the time where we need to be transitioned completely to renewables. It's the energy that we need at the moment. We cannot live like the Amish. To get it out of the ground by fracturing is just another method. It, it, if there are leaks at all, then something's wrong. Britain's gas supply is largely imported from abroad or is extracted offshore from the North Sea. We've all heard of fracking. It's a technique that the government want to use to build a homegrown onshore gas industry across the north of England but it's also a technique that's highly controversial. And at a time when other countries are beginning to ban fracking altogether, a new test site is underway in North Yorkshire. So is this something we should actually be worried about? Well, I travelled to Rydale in North Yorkshire to try and find out. And over the next 20 minutes or so, I'm going to share with you what I found. Kirby Misperton in Rydale is situated just below the North York Moors National Park, with the fracking test site sitting right on the edge of the village. Over the last few months, a combination of local people as well as anti-fracking campaigners from around the country have been hosting regular, non-violent protests. In what was once a sleepy village that few had heard of outside of North Yorkshire, well over half a million pounds has already been spent on policing the area. It's nine o'clock in the morning at the entrance to the fracking site. It's the first day of a protesting practice known as a lock-on. A group of women have blocked vehicles bringing fracking equipment onto the site by locking their arms into barrels filled with cement. The purpose of this is to slow the police down in removing them from the area, because attempting to move them could cause them serious injury. A specially trained team, therefore, is called to safely cut them free, a process that takes most of the morning. Once cut free, they will be arrested. A few hundred yards away from all this commotion, a protester, who is also a born and raised local resident, explained what the point of all this was, and why drilling into shale rock in this way is of such concern. For one thing, when you drill into a conventional um, oil or gas deposit, it's into sandstone, and it's pressurised by the, by the earth so that it flows freely from the well. A well like that can have about 15, 20 years lifespan. Um, a fracking well, you have to stimulate the shale to release the gas and it has about um, a one to three year lifespan. So for this industry to work you're going to need huge proliferation across the countryside, thousands of wells and we know from industry figures that over time all these wells fail. So they're going like a pincushion through our aquifers across this whole area and in 10, 15, 20, 100 years every single one of those wells will fail and the pollutants that have been put down but also the pollutants that are already down there will then be transferred either through normal fault lines or, or directly into the aquifer um, and contaminate our water. In fracking, huge volumes of water are mixed with sand and a chemical cocktail and then pumped underground at very high pressures in order to stimulate the release of gas from the shale rock. It's only been carried out often in the US and Australia since about 2006. Proponents of fracking claim it's been done without harm for decades what they are referring to is in fact a different method that uses far less high pressure water and is used to extend the life of a normal conventional gas well. A bit of sneaky political spin doctoring means these two methods are often falsely conflated. The night before, in London, I'd gone to speak to someone who'd recently been to Rydale and is very much at the forefront of the fracking debate. It's, uh, it's a very sad story that's emerging from America now in terms of the number of incidences of really quite severe pollution of groundwater, of aquifers and so on. And whatever the companies say about this, it's practically impossible to stop that happening. Because whenever you get further movement in those geological sediments, then the fluids the, they use, the chemicals that they're using, will be released into those watercourses. In the USA, a 30-month investigation claimed that the Pennsylvania Department of Environmental Protection 
had been routinely covering up hundreds of complaints of contaminated drinking water. This is the same heavily fracked state where a study of more than a million children has shown reduced infant health in those born to mothers who live within three kilometers of a well site. In America, the most heavily, heavily fracked states are very lightly populated. So you can go for miles in many of these states without a lot of human habitation. This is not the story in the UK. Back in the north of England, Breast Cancer UK has expressed serious concern over water contamination following a report by Yale University that found 55 potential or known human carcinogens in fracking fluid and 20 specific compounds that increase the risk of leukaemia and lymphoma. A few miles down the road from the well site, I meet a farmer who believes that the key to addressing this situation is local action. Most farmers, when I've gone around delivering leaflets uh, to farmers, most farmers are against fracking, but they're a little bit resigned to this idea that it's just going to happen. Well, I'm trying to give farmers some hope and say, actually, we can stop this, and farmers are vital in the struggle to stop it. We just need to get organised and fight back and say no to seismic surveys, say no to applications to site well pads, and we can stop this. If we had pollution of the aquifer, for example, in East Yorkshire, it's all served by one big aquifer. If that was polluted, it'd be virtually impossible to clean up. And of course, animals drink that, humans drink that. It's a livestock issue uh, if the water gets polluted. We can't bring in bottled water for animals. It's not just water pollution and public health that's an issue, but fracking's potential to exacerbate climate change. Supporters of fracking say that water pollution incidents are the result of bad practice rather than it being a risky technique. They also refer to frack gas as a low carbon transition fuel on the way to a more renewable energy future. However, not everyone agrees. We also know that these wells discharge a heck of a lot of methane at every single stage in the production, from the well through the pipes to the cracking station. Um, and methane is a far worse um, climate change greenhouse gas than, than CO2. So for climate change reasons, we have to leave this gas in the ground. We have enough gas in the North Sea to tide us over until we, should, till we are able to, to run completely on renewables, which is what we say this government should be pushing for, not an archaic fossil fuel that, that we don't need. So this, this argument about fracking being a, um, or fracking gas, shale gas being a transition fuel from traditional fossil fuels to renewables is just a little it's, it's, it's PR, greenwash. I mean, it's going to require billions of pounds worth of infrastructure. There's a, a lot of people who are going to be investing a lot of money in this, and the government's own pedal licenses require the companies to extract as much gas from their pedal license as possible. So if somebody comes along with a tidal option in the next 10 years, that's far cheaper, or if wind gets even cheaper, these guys in the fracking industry are still going to want to get their money out. So if we allow this industry to get a toehold in our area and across the north of England, we're looking at 30 years of fracking. And that will take us way beyond the time where we need to be transitioned completely to renewable. And that's become coming back to this issue about methane emissions, these fugitive emissions as they're called. And the story there is really interesting from the USA because it's quite clear now that if you've got emissions of about anywhere between 3 and 7% of the volume of gas being extracted, it makes that gas more carbon intensive than coal. So when people refer to frack gas as clean and low carbon, and some are even um, irresponsible enough to talk about zero carbon, they're either lying or they are not keeping up with the research. And that's critical because the government can't meet its carbon targets whilst it's simultaneously promoting a hydrocarbon industry in the UK that is more carbon intensive than coal. By definition, it doesn't add up. But then we have a generation of ministers in this government that have lived so long with the contradictions between trying to promote hydrocarbon companies and uh, exploration in the North Sea and so on and so forth, and trying to promote a low carbon future. They have this permanent cognitive dissonance going on in their minds. They don't even notice any longer the hypocrisy and the contradictions in what they're saying. 
Heading to the next village along from Kirby Mispeton, I'm keen to hear about what the pro-fracking community has to say about all this. But the opposition to fracking is so great amongst people in North Yorkshire that the ones that do support it are not keen to be identified. I'm grateful to the recent chairman of Rydale District Council, who is the only pro-fracker bold enough to stand up for their views on camera. If people haven't worked properly to try and prevent this, then they, they're likely to get big fines. The, the, the gas companies don't want leaks. They're in it to sell gas, not leak it. Bob didn't really have any answers for the environmental and public health impacts of fracking, but he did make a good point, and that's about the visual impacts and the industrialisation of a rural landscape. There is a lot of industry here that just is not looked at. It's agricultural industry, and there's lots of silos here and maltings and corn dryers, pig sheds, etc. These are far, far more visible than fracturing hydraulic fracturing pads will be. We have big pylons going across this countryside, not far from where we are now. We have huge, great big buildings. It's all based on agriculture and they're not tidily done and they're not surrounded by trees. I think that the, the, the worry about the look of the place will just not happen. It's true that well pads will be surrounded by trees, but these will take a long time to grow. And the sheer number of well pads that fracking requires means that many locals are still extremely worried about the visual impacts. Tourism is most likely to be affected by this, and Kirby Mispeton is home to one of Yorkshire's biggest holiday parks, which is concerned that it could endanger its one and a half million annual visitors. As an industry, tourism is one of the biggest in the entire region, and brings in over 200 million pounds a year. Visitors come from all over the world to enjoy the walking trails and scenery of the North York Moors National Park. Whilst well pads won't be sighted in the National Park, the horizontal drilling that's required means that fracking could happen in the rock directly underneath it. INEOS, another fracking company, is already seeking planning permission for 10 exploratory wells on the perimeter of this park to capture the gas from below. This is the same company that's already threatened to sue the National Trust to get access to its land in another part of the country. Despite this, supporters of fracking claim that tourism is only a seasonal industry in Yorkshire and that unconventional gas would provide year-round employment. So I can see a steadily increase, but uh, it's not going to have millions of jobs up here, but uh, it'll just be good for the area. This area has the lowest income on salaries and wages in the whole of Yorkshire. Uh, this has a potential to increase that. Bob is right. It'll not generate a huge number of jobs, as fracking only employs a handful of people per site. But then with so many well pads necessary to produce enough gas, this is certainly not a number to be sniffed at. That said, at the only well so far to be fracked in the UK, at Priest Hall in Lancashire, only 17% of jobs ended up going to local people. This all leads on to whether fracking will be a viable industry. In America, I think geologists were astonished to see how short a period of time you could actually anticipate commercially viable volumes of unconventional gases. This all comes down to, can you make money out of it? You know, can you get enough of it and sell it at a good enough price? to make it commercially viable. Now this is what makes the other side of this ludicrous here in the UK. We're never going to be able to sell UK fracked gas as cheaply as we can import gas from, from Norway, from Holland, from Qatar. I mean, the, the idea that we could actually do this at a cheaper late rate than those countries is, um, is insane, actually. The British Geological Survey has estimated that shale gas in the north of England could supply the UK for at least 25 years. But other academics believe this is overhyped, suggesting the nature of sedimentary rock in England is nowhere near as well suited to fracking as it is in the US, and that the government would be extremely unwise to rely on this form of gas production. Yeah, well, just to import it from abroad, it, it doesn't make sense, sense on many different levels. Um, common sense would tell you that it's more logical to get it yourself and if you import it from abroad um, you, the, the arguments against environment etc 
start losing because you've got to transport it across oceans or put it in pipelines from Russia, etc., etc. If we have it and we can exploit it properly and correctly, we are lucky to have it. I do take Bob's point that importing gas from abroad has its own environmental footprint, but most of this will be conventional natural gas, not fracked gas, which in the production stage has far less public health and environmental impacts than fracking. The viability of unconventional gas as an industry, though, comes back to this issue of well proliferation. I think there's loads of myths promoted about the shale gas industry and things that the media don't really get into. Um, one of the biggest uh, things is the sheer number of well sites that we're going to see if this industry takes off in a way that is economically viable. According to the former chairman of Shell, 84% of fracking wells become uneconomic within three years, meaning more and more wells must be dug just to stay in business. In addition to this, the professor of unconventional petroleum at Durham University stated that to recover 15% of shale gas over in Lancashire, 33,000 wells would need to be dug, and that for the UK to be independent of gas imports, we would need to continue drilling a thousand wells every year. It's really hard to understand that we are now the front line in the unconventional uh, gas industry in Britain. This is a bit of a shock for our area, and it's hard to see that this is going to proliferate and be thousands of wells if we let it. The advice from around the world is stop this now, stop it at the first well. It's so much easier to do that. The thing is, not everyone wants to stop at the first well, and travelling back to the well site for the last time, I got a sense for the efforts being expended to make sure that fracking happens. The most shocking thing about going down to the gate at Kirby Mispeton is the sheer number of policemen. Um, we're seeing um, up to 20 or so van loads of policemen. We have a right to protest, and that right is being severely limited. Get down. Ian, that's why you've been arrested. Why am I being arrested? Obstructing the highway. Okay. Uh, uh, obstructing the highway? Yeah. Obstructing the highway. Right. Thank you so much. It's in a ditch. Thank you. You've been warned you several times. What, uh, what, sorry? You carried on. I right. have not been warned at all. When was I warned? Yeah, I was arrested for obstructing the highway. And apparently, I was warned previous, numer numerous times, I think was the actual quote, numerous times today. And uh, actually, I don't think I was warned at all. So I'd love to see the uh, evidence gatherers footage. Look. Yeah. Well, having stipulated that they're only allowed to do these demonstrations for half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening, if you're 10 seconds over the stipulated half an hour, then technically you have rendered yourself liable for arrest. Um, but as I say, there's no legal basis to this half an hour limit. So when these things are tested in court, I don't know how that will stand up. There are some very powerful interests behind this um, notion of building a UK industry. And those interests have the ear of very senior people in the government. But the two big companies, that's Quadrilla and Ineos, are already pretty clearly out there saying that they're not going to let any public opinion stop them from pushing ahead with the proposed developments they've got. And Ineos in particular has been extremely aggressive, uh, very threatening to any idea of uh, big demonstrations against the plans that they've got. Um, for their own developments. And these are companies that are, I can honestly only describe them as brutish. Now we don't really know about Third Energy. The police tactics at the Kirby Mispeton site have been far from uh, gentle and quite intimidating and threatening to the local campaigners. Um, but that isn't necessarily a Third Energy decision, although they would have said to the police, you know what, we seriously don't want an ongoing demonstration here of local people or anti-fracking campaigners from around the country. Um, so we need to, I suspect there's been a suggestion or two that we need to nip this one in the bud so that it doesn't grow and grow. It was the end of the day and my time in Kirby Mispeton had come to an end. I was so tired after having got up at four in the morning to get there that I decided to stay the night and head back early the next morning. On the long drive south, I had many hours to chew things over. A 
eventually, I was back in London. I have to say I was really surprised about what I saw in Yorkshire. The, um, the amount of police presence that's everywhere um, that's so kind of abrupt and against local opposition to the fracking site it seems to be very much two opposing sides here and that's kind of sad to see really. The local opposition is just so strong and it's, it's kind of unsurprising now that I've had a look at a lot of the evidence which just stacks up massively against fracking. You know, and I'm driving back into a city now where the mayor, Sadiq Khan, has actually put into place uh, measures or is putting into place measures to help local councils block fracking applications in the city because actually there's quite a few uh, reserves of shale gas in different pockets within London and now Sadiq Khan is saying well no we don't want this here he's, he's being very forthright in standing up against this um, and okay yes he's not part of the, the, the government you know essentially that is trying to push this forward um, but I just think this is a bit unfair that this is happening in somewhere there's a big city um, that's quite often uh, you know, regarded as the hub of the UK, everything's very London-centric. And yet up in North Yorkshire, where there's so much opposition to, to fracking and the, and the damages could be almost so much greater, uh, these guys are just going to run in front of me, then up there it's almost certainly going to go ahead if they find large reserves of, of gas. So to sum it all up, fracking in the north of England is looking more than just a bit concerning. In the last few years, Bans have been enforced all over the world, not least in Scotland and Ireland, but also by the likes of France, Germany, and even several states in both Australia and America. Even the shale gas rich state of New York has banned fracking on the grounds of it being an unacceptable risk to human health. Taking this all into account, one question really remains. Will the government follow the example of other countries, or is it just going to ignore them and push on regardless? The answer to that is pretty much anyone's guess. I personally started off not really knowing whether to support fracking or whether to oppose it. But having examined the recent evidence on it, I think I know which side of the fence I now sit. So thank you very much for watching. I'll let you make up your own mind. Um, please do subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, and if you want to send me some ideas about documentaries that you'd like to see being made, then uh, please go ahead. I'd really appreciate it.